you're listening to Prep Period, the only podcast for teachers that's focused on quick wins and actionable tips that can be implemented in your classroom tomorrow. Prep Period starts in three, two, one. Welcome to the Prep Period Podcast. Uh, as always, my name is Brian Bean. I'm going to be your host. And today we've got something special. Okay? Our guest is Adam Carroll from, well, from pretty much everywhere, as, as you will soon see. Uh, our topics for today, we're going to talk about Adam's philosophy about teaching personal finance, especially the fact that money isn't real for students today. Um, and that students really need to make money mistakes early and often. So I am super excited with that. Welcome, Adam. So first things first, let's get our listeners a little bit more familiar with you. Um, Adam Carroll spent 15 years helping people do more with the money that they make. He's an internationally recognized financial literacy expert, author of four Amazon bestsellers, a two-time TED Talk speaker with over 5 million views on YouTube. Uh, But despite all that, this is career highlight. I'm assuming we've reached the peak now. Yeah, this is it, man. Uh, You created, uh, let me make sure I get this right, Broke, Busted, and Disgusted. It's a documentary aired on uh, CNBC and is shown in literally hundreds, thousands of high schools and colleges across the country, right? Uh, He's the host of the Build a Bigger Life podcast and the founder of the Shred Method. When Adam isn't speaking at conferences, consulting with companies, or hosting leadership retreats in exotic locations, uh, you're going to have to show me how to get into that gig, (laughs) Uh, you'll most likely find him at home shooting hoops or having Nerf Wars with his kids. So with that intro, I feel... Like I'm in the presence of royalty. I'm so excited. Oh, geez. I, can I record that and air that for my wife? Absolutely. Every now and again? I come home from events, Brian, and she's like, clean the toilet, pal. So I, I get my <laughs> my humility at home. She serves me some humble pie. Well, but thank you, you for what, having next me. Next time you're doing a, a consulting retreat at some exotic location, you need a hype man. You just call me. Done I and done. Hype man. Done and done. All right. Now. For our listeners who somehow maybe are not familiar with you, and this is their first exposure to Adam Carroll, okay? One of the things that I've actually, I've heard you say this to me before uh, as well, is that for students today, money isn't real. Mm -hmm. So, obvious first question, what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, when I first realized that money wasn't real to this generation, Um, I was speaking on college campuses, Brian, and I had been on 750 college campuses all across the country, everywhere from Florida State University on the East Coast to the University of Spoiled Children on the West Coast. You know where that's at? (laughs) And every school that that I presented, where I presented, I would ask the question, how much student loan debt will you have when you graduate? And the answer that I got overwhelmingly, do you know what it was? My guess is they said, I don't know. They did. They said, "I, I have no clue. And I'd say ballpark, best guess. And they'd be like, I I couldn't even venture, I guess. And so I'm watching them spend money and not realize they're spending money or not realize how much money they're spending. And at that moment, it was like, well, this isn't even real to most of these young people. And then we started developing all this fintech like Venmo. and, And, you know, obviously PayPal was a thing already, but you get to Venmo where I could pay you out of my Venmo account with a couple of pushes of a button. And it doesn't feel like I've sent you anything, though I have, I've transferred value to you. And then I started noticing on many college campuses, if you wanted to go into the dining center, Brian, you just lay your fingertip on the reader and it scans your fingerprint and then charges your U-bill. Wow. I'm like, this is even more abstract for these young people. And- It's like science fiction. Right, right. I mean, we might as well have units uh, that are floating above digitally uh, around our head. And when we hit it, it just transfers dig- you know, units from one person to another, which is essentially what we're doing. Yeah. And, um, and I was really taken aback by just the lack of awareness by you know, high school, middle school, high school, college students of how much they were spending, what they were spending, that they were spending. And I really wanted to bring that to the forefront. So that's what I mean when money isn't real. I mean, we've, we've created a society where money is so intangible for most people that they can't even fathom how it functions in society today. You know, you're absolutely right. We're going to, we're going to, 
right out the gate, we're going to go off script now. So yeah. <laughs> we're going to throw the script away because I want to keep talking about this very concept because you're right. Uh, and when you think about it, when you remove that physical action of parting with your wealth, when you remove yes. that from the equation, it becomes so much easier to spend money yeah. and you, without thought. So if that's the case... It seems like that's priority number one for teachers. Anyone who's going to teach personal finance and that responsibility, how do they overcome that barrier of, I'm trying to teach you about money, and to you, money isn't real? Right. Well, number one, and this was the, this was the issue in our house, was the kids would see us swipe a, a credit card or a debit card at the grocery store. And literally, I mean, if you were to time that transaction – that transaction takes maybe 10 seconds. Yeah. Stick the card in the reader. Maybe you key in your pin, you pull it out, you stick it back in your wallet. A kid could turn around and look at, you know, something in the aisle and turn around and it's done. So they don't have any concept for, and I'm talking about young children. Yeah. They don't have any concept that money is exchanged hands. It's just like, Oh, we went and got groceries. Yeah. I show them this piece of plastic. They give me stuff. This is yeah. great. And where it became really apparent for me, um, well, before that, I used to, I, I remember going to the grocery store with my parents and I remember them writing checks and I remember, this is going to date me, but I remember them writing checks where the teller would say, or the cashier would say, what is your social security number? And they would give it to them oh and the, the cashier would write it on the check to the extent, Brian, that I can give you my par both of my parents' social security numbers. I don't know. Let's today. try it. Why don't you give them to me now? We'll just see. 48198. No, I'm just kidding. We'll give you the last four. But I, I literally know both of my parents' social security numbers wow. because it was ingrained in my head when I watched them do that. And my mom was meticulous about writing down how much was the check and balancing the checkbook in the moment where my dad would write the check and he would balance the checkbook a week later and it would drive my mom crazy. Wow. And fast forward to my kids growing up and watching us do what we do. I got my first Apple pay account on, on an iPhone. And I went through the same grocery store that I, you know, the chain that I grew up with and, and worked at when I was a teenager. And I went through and the first time I, I put my phone over the sensor and did Apple pay my son, who was seven at the time, he goes, dad, I can't wait to get a phone so I can buy stuff. Oh. And I was like, this is wrong. This is, this is not what I want. And so in the moment, Brian, what I realized was, um, you know, I had been speaking on college campuses. I was faced with the realization that money isn't real on the campus. Money isn't real to kids. And the number one thing that we have to do as educators is we have to make sure that students are using cash because they need to feel the tangibility of money and feel what it's like to give a $50 bill to the cashier and get a few dollars or cents back and the difference that that is from hitting one click ship on Amazon for $47, because we'll do that all day long yeah. and not think twice about it. Yeah. Now, when I think about this, uh, on the one hand, uh, I think, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, yep. I wish every, like my, I have teenage boys and I want them to go mow somebody's lawn and get paid in cash. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to happen anymore where I live. I, the, but that's what I want them to do. I want them to get yeah. cash that way. Go get a babysitting job and get paid two bucks an hour, something. Totally. And totally. then go use that money to go buy something at the store. Um, and I, th that's the gut reaction. But now let me yep. play devil's advocate. Okay. You and I may very well be dinosaurs that are about to become extinct. You know, the, the world technology may inevitably go in this direction where we become a cashless society. Yeah, it will. So the the challenge then is teaching students how to make concrete decisions with an abstract concept. Yep. Right. Um, I know that you and I. Uh, I'm familiar with your work. You're somewhat familiar with my teaching model. We have a lot of similar philosophies when it comes to how to teach personal finances. One thing that I really like that you've harped on many times that I think might be intricate to this process that we're talking about is the idea that students and people in general, they need to make mistakes. They need yeah. to make financial mistakes early. And I, I believe you say uh, you're exactly early and often. Early and often. Yeah. Where's the value? Help us understand the value in making the mistakes early and often. 
So I love this question, Brian, because it goes back to my experience on college campuses. When I would talk to these students and they would ask me, some of them would come up and, and just be very forthcoming about the fact that their parents took care of everything. Yeah. You know, and these are like 21, 22, sometimes 24 year olds that would say, yeah, I, I just don't know how much anything costs because my parents have always taken care of this stuff. And in the moment, while I understand why they do it, I think at some point societally, we've conflated love and struggle. So we, we believe that I love my kids. Like I, I truly believe you love your teenage boys. No question. I love my kids. And therefore, I don't want them to struggle. That's sort of the message that we have societally yeah. today. And the reality is that the opposite may be true. The opposite is true. And we like the struggle has to occur for them to pop out on the other side as successful, productive adults. And so case in point, um, there's a good friend of mine who is a, a very successful entrepreneur. He got into the cellular telephone market years and years and years ago, like probably 25 years ago, he opened the first franchise store for this local carrier. Hmm. And he's been super successful ever since. And he built this long-term residual business with it. Just brilliant guy. And the other day I was talking to him and he said, you know, my daughter's going off to college and I think we've done a great job. And I asked her, how do you think we've done preparing you to leave the nest? And she goes, great on everything, but I know nothing about money. Hmm. And I said, how is she 18 and you've been so successful and she doesn't know anything about money? And he said, I gave her a credit card. She's an authorized user on my credit card. And I said, if you need anything, put it on here. And I said, what does that mean exactly? And he said, she puts her gas on it. She, if she goes shopping, she puts her shopping on it. If she wants to get something to eat with her friends, she'll treat her friends to things and put that on there. And we pay it. And so long as it isn't crazy, I don't say anything. And I'm like, this, this, this proves my point that money is abstract. Yeah. Because if she has no clue of how much she's spending and you're not calling her, you know, holding her accountable or calling her to the carpet on any of it, it's on you. It's not on her. And so she's going to be an 18 or 22 or 25 year old person still reliant on dad or mom covering all the bills. So when I say we need to have them fail early and often, what I mean by that is, hey, if the kid has five bucks in his hand and he goes into Target and he buys $5 worth of candy. When he comes out, the lesson is, well, you just spent $5 on candy. How do you feel? And he'll either be like, I feel great. I bought a bunch of candy. Right. And if he eats all the candy and he gets sick, you're like, well, you just wasted five bucks on candy that you just puked up, you know? <laughs> That's a lesson. Yeah, it all depends on the candy. I mean, if he's buying Laffy Taffy, I, I understand. But if he walks out with $5 in Tootsie Rolls, that's just a waste of money, right? That's right. I mean, that's right. I'm with you. I'm totally with you on this. <laughs> And so as we just lose Tootsie Rolls as a sponsor for our <laughs> yeah. So with our kids, what we did, we started, we started an allowance program when they were much younger. And the deal was they got a dollar per year of age per week. Mm. And they had to do chores in order to get the money. There was no like paying commission and all that. I know there's a lot of gurus out there that will say, oh, pay your kids commission. Well, I have a couple of pretty savvy kids that'll be like, I don't care how much you're going to pay me to pay the to clean the toilet. I'm not going to do it. Right. So we said, you have this spat of chores you have to do. You will only get the money if you do them because that's how our house runs. But when you get the money, it's yours to do with as you please. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had rules. 10% goes to saving, 10% to investing, 10% to giving. 70% is yours to do what you want. We had a, a family 401k plan where we would put 20, I would match whatever they put in their investment jar up to 25 bucks a month. Wow. And, um, you know, the lesson was that if you wanted to buy a $50 Nerf gun, well, go for it. I mean, that's, it's your $50. Just know that it's going to take you a few months to save that back up again. And my one son, my middle son, middle child, uh, oldest son, he would always put $25 in the invest jar because he knew I'd double it. So even if he had to borrow out of the save or, or, you know, a different a month of 70% that he had to spend, he would do that because he knew he was going to double his money if he put 25 bucks in the invest jar. And all the way along. I wish I could find somebody who would just match every investment right? that I make. Right? It's a pretty good deal. But I, I um, and you'll appreciate this, Brian. One of the things I told them was you will not go to school. You will not go to college until you have an MBA. 
Hmm. And they were like, well, what do you mean by that? I said, you will have a massive bank account before you go to college. And I set a goal for them that they had to have $5,000 set aside in a savings account before they hit 18. And my 17 year olds there, my 15 year olds, you know, 80% there. Wow, my 13 year old is 60% there. So when you, when you set these commitments and uh, expectations of them, generally speaking, they'll strive to meet them. And I think that's what we have to do around money with kids is give them the opportunity to fail early and often, and then set expectations like, okay, now that you know how to handle money, here's the goal. Yeah. And they'll rise to meet that, that expectation. Oh, well, I like that the, the groundwork uh, to develop the skills and develop the perspective is laid first. Yes. Um, one of the things that, so I'll just plug my own teaching model here for a second. Do it. One of the things about my teaching model that worked so well is that every decision that students made in class financially carried an opportunity cost of some kind that they could see almost immediately. Yes. So you'd be like, I want this thing, but if I buy it, I can't get that. And I want that too. And I had to decide which one I want more. Or we'd throw in needs. And it's like, I want this, but I need that. Yeah. You know, what am I willing to sacrifice? And, and I think that is just absolutely instrumental in the learning process. Totally. And, and I don't think that finances owns the monopoly on this either. I think that that can right. hold true in almost any subject matter. Where, you know, students have, you put them in a position to take control of the direction of their learning. Yes. Uh, and it, it just unlocks a completely different part of their brain that takes them to a different level, is my personal belief. My dad, my dad has this term that he uses in, a, he's an organizational development guy. And he taught me about shared ownership. Yeah, And shared ownership, I think, is really important for parents and kids around money. And he said, to have shared ownership, you have to have three things. You have to have information, you have to have decision-making, and you have to have consequences. Hmm. So as an example, I, find, I found that a lot of college students with whom I spoke said, I have no idea how much my parents saved for college for me. Um, I have no idea how much I'll have to borrow. I have no idea how much they've taken out in Parent PLUS loans. And for us, we create a shared ownership model around that, where I would tell my kids, this is exactly how much money there is in the various accounts for college. You are going to determine from an information perspective, how much the schools you're looking at cost and what it's actually gonna be over four years. Then we have decisions to make. And the decisions are, you know, are you gonna be an RA? Are you gonna work full-time? Uh, are, are you going, how much debt are you gonna take on? Cause I'm not gonna take on any debt. Yeah. for you. How many scholarships are you going to apply for? And what's the percentage likelihood that you're going to win some of these? So we get, it's a numbers game. Yeah. And then the consequences of those decisions are, I'm going to show you exactly how much you'll owe and exactly how much those payments are going to translate to when you graduate. And it's amazing when you have a shared ownership conversation like that, they get it. Like my, my kids all get it. They know how much college costs are and, and what they're going to have to save and how much yeah. scholarship money they're going to get. I love it. And, and, you know, even the concept of student loans kind of, when you think about it, that, that just doubles down on this concept that it's abstract money because oh. they might walk away with, you know, $80,000 of student loan debt that translates to a few hundred bucks a month in their payment because it's amortized out to 20 years. And so yeah. they don't think about the fact $80,000, I'm going to pay back 160 because of interest. Yeah over 20 years, they just think about, oh, it's two, 300 bucks a month, but I'm going to yeah. get this great job after I graduate. So 300 bucks a month is nothing kind of a thing. And it just kind of fuels the abstract fire. Yeah. Well, know, and to, to boot, they also will, will not, I mean, they'll say, well, I'll, I'll go into forbearance or deferment for six months or 12 months. And then by the time they get back out and start paying, because they found that dream job, now the, that student loan has grown by $5,000 in interest and you know delayed payments. And they're like, I didn't borrow this much money. No, you didn't. You borrowed 5,000 less and then decided not to pay it for, exactly. you know, for a year. Um, yeah, that's the scary part. And in the, in the documentary, Broke, Busted and Disgusted, we interviewed a woman by the name of Allison who was a, um, she was a veterinarian. She had her doctor of veterinary medicine degree. And when I asked her, how much debt do you have? She said $298,000. Wow. 
And I know what the payment on 298 is going to be, but I, I, and I, we asked them all, how much is your payment a month? And she said, $1,200 a month. Now, if you do the math, that's $14,400 a year in payments. Yeah. But the doctor of veterinary medicine level loans are at like six to 8%. Yeah. So 8% on 300,000 is $24,000 a year in interest, which means her loans were growing every by $10,000 every single year. Yeah. And, and this is where it's like, it was abstract. She just needed to go get the, wanted to get the degree, right? Yeah, it, it's so funny you mentioned that. So, you know, I sold my company a while back, uh, got a little bit of a financial windfall from that. And I, the first thing I did is I went and I, I paid off all my student loans. I had made, we'll, we'll call them bad choices. We'll, we'll call that. I, I had a lot of student loans. Yeah. Um, but uh, I had never, ever missed a payment. I had had to go on to deferment a couple times for forbearance, but I'd yep. never missed a payment. And I've been paying on these student loans for almost 20 years. Now, when you think about it, according to how these things work, it's supposed to be done after 20 years. Right. Right. But I wasn't, I wasn't even close. Because I'd also been doing, you know, income based repayment. Oh, yeah. All these different things to make my monthly payment more manageable because I'm a school teacher and I don't make a lot of money. All yep. these different kind of things. And uh, when I finally paid them off, I paid out over $10,000 more than I actually ever borrowed. And that's wow. after having paid 20 years of payments. I still owed 10 grand more than what I actually had borrowed. If I had continued doing it based, and, and it's not like I did anything like, I don't want to say overly irresponsible. I was doing everything within the program that the government laid out. Sure, sure. You can borrow this money. You can yep. make these payments and, and that's fine. Yeah. I never did anything, you know, untoward on anything of that. Yeah. I, if I hadn't they, I'd sold my company, I would have probably never got out well, of student loan debt. And you know, the interesting thing is that yours, like that story is so commonplace today. When I talk to, to, to people that could be in their forties, fifties, I know folks in their sixties and seventies that still have student loan debt. Wow. Many of, much of it is either parent plus loans or, or some of it's their own. And it was advanced level, uh, you know, education debt. But the, the average length of time to pay back loans today is 21 to 23 years. Wow. And the government will say, we want to make college affordable which is true, they do, by shrinking the payment and extending your payments out into perpetuity. Yeah. And what they're, not say, what they're saying is, we wanna make college affordable. What they're not telling you is, you are going to hate these for the last 15 <laughs> years of your life because right. it'll be like, can I please just kick this thing to the curb? Yeah, so. and, and, and the, the, the scary thing is I had multiple financial advisors tell me not to do it, not to pay it off because mm. my interest rates were so low. Yep. They're like, dude, just go invest that money somewhere else. You will get a higher return than paying that off. But it's like I said, if I don't pay this off, I'm going to never pay it off. Right. It will be there forever. Right. You know, I used to joke with my wife. Um, and so, you know, I'm getting my doctorate degree. Uh, I've got a master's degree. I used to joke with my wife that I, my plan was to just never stop going to college. And then I never have to pay off my student loans and I'll just yes. keep going to college. I'll have like eight degrees when I die and then I don't yeah. have to worry about it anymore. It's somebody else's problem. <laughs> but, there are people who are doing that right now. I mean, we did, when we did the doc, we interviewed folks who said, I'm going to take one or two classes every year for the rest of my life, just so I'd never have to pay student loans again. Wow. Well, and you, you know, should... it's, it, it is a strategy. It is a it strategy. Is a strategy. <laughs> By definition, it is a strategy. <laughs> well, I tell you what, uh, thank you so much for your time. We've gone a little bit overboard, but I don't really care. It's been really fun to talk. Um, you know, uh, I'll leave you on this note. You talk about the the strategy you've taken with your kids and uh, yeah. and preparing them for college and helping them understand and it. It reminds me a lot of my own father's strategy. So my dad took the same strategy as you. I knew exactly how much money was set aside and that number was zero. <laughs> he, had, he had set aside <laughs> no money for me. So I had to make all those decisions for myself. So I think that, uh, I think your way might've been a little, a little better for lack of a better word. 
Um, and uh, I think that we've taken, we've given a lot of nuggets to the listeners out here. Yeah. Either teaching or people who have families and kids. Uh, it's applicable. If you're a parent, you're a teacher, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and to the educators and to the parents out there, what I would tell you is that that your your kids, whether you're teaching them in class or you're teaching them at home, they are ready for advanced thought around this. They're craving it, in fact. And the earlier you share it with them, the the more readily they will absorb it as they get older. Um, you know, I've got teenagers who, I mean, they're, my son was like, dad, what's, what's Bitcoin price at? And you know, what, what is Apple stock doing today? And did, when it split, did, did it go back up again? Or where are we at? These are questions they're asking. And that's not, I mean, I know 50 and 60 year olds that wouldn't know to ask some of those questions right. well, and all they need, we just need to introduce it. And so I applaud the educators out there and I love what you guys are doing because this is, this, this is like. This is purpose-driven work for me and for you, Brian, I know. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. My pleasure. Okay, I want to thank Adam one more time for coming on as a guest uh, to our podcast. What a great episode. Uh, For those of you who are thinking you might want to check out some of his resources and some of the things that he's done, uh, go and check out his website, masteryofmoney.com. And also, it'd be worth a, a look to go watch his documentary. It's called Broke, Busted, and Disgusted. Um, As far as my final thought for the day, you know, I want to echo what he said um, about, you know, just one way or another, if you're a teacher and you've got students or parents and you've got kids, you know, find a way to increase their accountability, but also their ownership of their own education and their decisions. Uh, I think that is a tremendous, tremendous benefit to students in their learning process, and I couldn't echo it any louder. Uh, So with that, like always, uh, if you or anyone that you know you think would be interested in being a guest on our podcast, please reach out to me at brian.bean at stukent.com. That's Brian with an I, bean just like the vegetable. Uh, So with that, thank you very much for listening. 